um, super grateful that Katie's here with us today. She's super innovative creative director, VFX artist and designer. She's worked with a ton of clients. She is most known, I think, currently for a lot of her work with uh, musicians like Nalbani and Cardi B and Nicki Minaj, but she's also been commissioned by people like Nike, I mean, companies like Nike and Amazon Music. And she was recently published in Time Magazine, Building a Better Future NFT Collection. And she, ha she has a very broad and dynamic range of expertise that she'll be sharing with us today. So we're just super grateful to have her here and I'll let you kick it off, Katie. Thank you. Awesome. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Um, thank you to the chair of the lecture series, uh, Brett Yasko for the invitation to speak as well as Langston Wells for all the help on setting up this event. Um, so just touching upon what Langston just said, for anyone who's not familiar with my work, I'm a creative director, the effects artist and designer. I specialize in creating work that embodies female strength and power. My clients are some of the biggest artists in the world, including Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, Normani, Lizzo, as well as companies like Nike, Amazon, Music, Hypebeast, and more. Before becoming an independent creative director, I worked as an art director at Apple and as a creative designer at the Google Creative Lab. Um, this is some samples of my work, some of my Nike projects, personal work, my crazy animation for this talk. And yeah, so this is, um, I, this is my collaborators and people that work within my studio. So I've had the chance to collaborate with some incredible people over the course of my career thus far. Um, here are the most consistent collaborators and their unique backgrounds. There's a CMU alum, Marissa Liu, which some of you might be familiar with. We've done a lot of the effects work together. Um, I truly believe teamwork is the ultimate way to manifest new ideas into the world. And these are some of the most diverse and talented technologists, designers, directors, photographers. And these are people that are just, invested, just as invested in the future as I am. And they care about pushing culture forward Throughout this lecture, I'll be speaking to different works I've created and co-created, so you can get a greater understanding of the root of my design philosophy and the way that it has built over time since I was a student like you. I will give an in-depth explanation of the process behind the work and then give a bit more background on my personal motivations behind why I make the work that I do. So just to go over some of the people here, DressX is a virtual fashion company. They collaborated with me on the jacket that is in my poster, which will actually be available in AR on their platform. So if you ever wanted to try it on, you could virtually try on the jacket that's in my poster. Nina Hawkins is the avatar um, specialist who worked with me on my avatar for this poster. And a lot of these people are massive successes in, in their own right. And we've made a lot of really great work together. So to go, Go back to the beginning. Um, I started my career in a sim very similar environment to the one we are in today, actually. When I was a student at the Rhode Island School of Design, one of my favorite designers, the iconic Virgil Abloh, came to give a lecture. I ended up speaking to Virgil after the talk, and shortly after, I was hired by his long-term collaborator, Joe Perez, to work on a range of projects in the music and fashion industry. Joe proved to be a positive mentor and supportive collaborator for many years to come. And actually in my senior year, I ended up working on an incubator for Off-White and Louis Vuitton, doing a bunch of different logo designs, some of which I'll show later in this presentation. And this was kind of what kickstarted my career. Um, so one of the projects I worked on with Joe and Jenna Marsh was the Queen album cover for Nicki Minaj. The Queen album process took about six months and was very much based on creating design languages that represent femininity and strength. Nikki was very specific with the tone of the cover and it being based on her research and her Indian and African heritage. Uh, I spent many months researching in the RISD library and creating symbols, experimenting with typography and developing the art direction for the image. Ancient warrior goddesses were the source of inspiration for Nikki's attire and pose. And the typography was an idea that actually started as a drawing in my dorm room. So I did this as a student and um, the Queen logo, what it turned into. Queen Radio. What up, y'all? It's Nicki Minaj, aka Megatron. That's that brand new Nicki. Megatron is out. So if you're familiar with Queen Queen Radio, then you'll you've heard those noises before. And Nicki's um, uh, the way she works around with that Queen logo as a part of her marketing for um, her radio show. So the Queen logo really played. An important role in the widespread appeal of the marketing. Almost all of the videos is of the logos zooming in and out, and she used it on stage. 
So to me, that really inspired me about what could happen when you're creating strong and powerful feminine work that it can start as a sketch in your dorm room and turn into this thing that really penetrates culture and really speaks to people and uplifts women's voices. And that all was something that really resonated with me. Um, Nikki had many other uh, designers and not, not these, but this will lead to my next point. Many other graphic designers pitch ideas for the queen typography, but it turned out that the request for a strong feminine type design was not such a simple ask as it had very little precedent and required people to engage with a side of themselves that they were not necessarily comfortable expressing. When I originally did research, I saw many bold sans serif typefaces representing strength in graphic form and many handwritten representations connected to female products and more specifically domesticity. But most of these sans serif faces were created by men and very much felt like a reflection of their expression of strength. And it turns out that the handwriting used in makeup products and marketed to women was born from male-led ad agencies and their view of a woman's role in society. The handwriting seemed to be directly connected to the idea that the female domain is confined to the domestic environment. This sparked my interest into the roots of type design and how it connects to perhaps a subconscious patriarchal expression that we have accepted without realizing it. To create this genuinely female-centric typography for Nikki, I had to go even further back. To um, pulling from ancient cultures that had female empires. And this way, my creative process was propelled by both the historic value of strong women and a bold incorporation of the expression of the female body. This is some of my references that went into the queen logo. So a lot of them are references that feel like the female form, uh, references from different cultures that represent leaders, personal power, things like that. So that was kind of where these influences led into creating that identity. This work also impact, had a direct impact in pop culture in the form of merchandise and this traveled the world and was a staple at many of her concerts. It was a direct way to sort of interact with the bigger public. I also did another piece of typography for her that ended up in merch that went on her European tour. And a lot of this became the strong theme of women owning their place in the world, taking up space and um, having a strong sense of their own personal power um, and it turned even into people getting tattoos of it, which was pretty cool. So that was some of my process. Um, and in my research, I discovered that women were kept out of type design process for many centuries. This became a big part of the education that I did. I did a Brown RISD um, degree and at Brown, I focused specifically on gender studies and typography and understanding how women have been involved or not involved in the process for centuries. And basically type design was a trade that you had to apprentice for. And since women were not allowed to become apprentices, they essentially were not as involved in the process for a long time. So type design was owned and bred by men without women being really involved for a long time. And early Roman letter forms were actually based on the idea of divine proportion, which you can see here, which is directly derived from the study of the male body. So perhaps we have been living in a world where visual expression is confined to the male form of expression and no one has really noticed. And that was something that really blew my mind in my research and how the body is so directly related to our type design practice and visual communication. Um, so this be essentially became the ethos of my type design practice and why some of my typography looks so alien to some. As I worked with more artists and brands, this was actually for Off-White, I aimed to create references to female form at times this was done in subtle, almost subconscious ways. On other occasions, it was clearly conveyed by the unique script choice. My process involved lots of drawings and design experimentation that later turned into more elegant refined forms. This says heaven and a lot of this is referencing sort of the curvilinear elements of female body um, and yonic expression sort of within that. So, um, you would be surprised at how some people have reacted very strongly to my typography, as if it was a personal affront to the world order. So yes, I guess typography, typography can be controversial. The integration of the female form in letter forms with some, with some of my male near viewers left them unnerved. Perhaps a deeper part of them was not used to not seeing their image reflected back to them in this subliminal way. Perhaps they could not relate to the female-centric design that was so foreign. On the other hand, I gained many women clients. It became gratifying and encouraging to me to discover how many women loved my typography and asked me to make it for them. 
There was one case with a project where both men on the team rejected my typography at the very last minute, but two women fought for it and it ended up being chosen for publication and it made headlines and it really helped a campaign. This experience seemed to confirm my hypothesis that feminine typography was making an impact and it was something new and exciting. This was a project I worked on at the Google Creative Lab around a menstruation Google Doodle, which I wanted to create something that was both powerful and evocative of the experience that women have, as well as translating um, this, this design philosophy that I'd been making. This was a project I did for Nike, and it was focused on highlighting women in the streetwear industry in LA who were building careers. Um, the identities were created to show them as icons in the making, and that's what this word says over and over again. And this sort of design language would flex in different ways where it, it's a little more clear and obvious in this context, a little more artistic and expressive in other contexts. This is a Louis Vuitton logo I did um, for, during that off-white Virgil uh, campaign, and this is an off-white crazy typography experiment that I did. A lot of this was centered around futurism, and typography, this is actually something I worked on for Apple as an intern and I kind of snuck in a bit of my typography in there as you can almost subliminally reference. Um, and yeah, so this was all kind of heavily where I went into typography and how it turned into some of the projects that I'm gonna show you later on. But this was my early experimentation as a student and what influenced my way of thinking. And although type design is one of my passions, in college after interning at Apple, I became focused on the power of 3D rendering and the artistic expression behind it. I also found this to be a space devoid of female expression. 3D art is largely an ex a tech extension of fine art. I decided to build upon the work of female artists like Judy Chicago, Hilma Af Klimt, George O'Keefe, whose work jointly embraces the idea that the feminine is universal and that the female form can be desexualized to the female gaze. I also look to more current examples like Iris Van Erpen as a source for my 3D illustrations. This all to me felt very groundbreaking because in the environments that I was witnessing 3D illustration, there was practically no women on the mood boards. There was no female artists influencing the overall decisions. And this was the kind of 3D rendering that was being sold to the world through tech products and things like that. Um, so this was a rendering I did as part of my senior thesis uh, which has this woman in this kind of feminine world, almost very reminiscent of Chicago or Iris Van Erpen in the, in the line quality or in the shapes. And it was just sort of interjecting that creative expression into this uh, tech world. Uh, yeah, so I ended up doing a lots of different experimentations and simulations with different tools to build my skill set. So this was done and using um, Grasshopper and Rhino, and it's this procedural rendering, which means that to create these forms, there's a lot of math, and nodes involved. And I really wanted to see basically what was the limits of different tool sets within this new expression I was interested in. This is a, uh, a sculpture done in ZBrush where I was playing around with texture mapping and sort of the errors within computer generated art and how something maps onto different forms. And that is what's generating this sort of, um, uh, rusty look on this this model. Um, this was a rendering that I worked on as part of my senior thesis as well, which was both a product idea, but also it was trying to insert some of these more bodily forms into the 3D environment and space. And so this was uh, simulated with Marvelous Designer, the cloth simulator, and then it was rendered in Redshift um, and all the little details there, you can see like down to the thread count prior to zoom in. And so all of this research became really important for me from for my, for my student phase to when I became a part of the music industry because I was able to incorporate a lot of these new skills into my practice in the music industry and become really heavily in VFX, which is a lot of what I'm known for right now. So this is a cover I did for an artist named Emmeline, which really pushes the boundaries of gender expression from the female point of view or uh, sexual expression even. This was for a viral song she had and it very much was referencing Judy Chicago and um, the crowning specifically that painting. So it was incorporating that into both photography and the effects and all the, a lot of the flowers there are simulated and the typography even has little forms within it that reference the female body like under the S that's actually like the shape of a woman almost sitting 
there's a lot of subtle details of incorporating female form back into these design languages. And so this went viral and it was all over the internet, both the, um, the album cover and the song itself, which is speaking to this topic. And this is a um, crazy visualizer I made for her. And uh, this is the process of how I made the album cover. So started from a sketch. I directed a photo shoot with a photographer, worked within CG to create all these elements on her, did a lot of uh, drawing within RoboFont and then dimensionalized it edited it, composited it, and then created this final image. So I brought that to TikTok for <laughs> the audience that likes to see quick processes. And yeah, this was all part of a campaign for her that eventually led to this cover, which was for Normani and Cardi B. So doing a lot of that VFX work just on an indie artist scale. She's now signed with Capitol Records recently, but um, at the time she was indie. And this, it led to this project though, where both Normani and Cardi really wanted something really ethereal and um, empowering. And they came to me to create the type design and VFX. And I worked on this with Marissa Liu, the CMU alum. And um, this remains one of the pieces that I'm most proud of um, because it incorporates so much of my thinking from the type design that you saw in the beginning to the VFX work. This is almost a next layer of my thesis. If you look at the, the pedestal and its design, I sculpted that in ZBrush and it was very much derivative of the female anatomy in a lot of ways. Um, and this was became kind of viral. And what really fascinated me is how almost every article mentioned the typography. And it just kind of in, um, confirmed to me that doing something new and different within the typography space has so much marketing value and business value to clients because it gives more people more to talk about, more interest or an intrigue into a piece of work. So this is like a, a little video of someone talking about the type of Oh, okay. Yeah, that was, that was a five part. Yeah, that's right cool. There. I really like how they have the hair. And then the, if you look at the typography, uh -huh. it has uh, the same, the type same of kind of thing. Yeah. So it's cool. Uh, the yeah. So uh, there is stuff like that all over the internet and um, one of the quotes here says that the typography is mirroring the two stars hair, which covers them. Almost every single um, piece of uh, information here somehow references it, which, yeah, was kind of uh, powerful to me to see that happen. And the reaction also from young women and just people around the world was pretty crazy to this art, drawing the typography and um, putting it on their nails and um, all this other crazy stuff, making paintings of it, drawings, dressing up dolls, it all sort of seemed to really resonate with people. And that was really exciting to me and everyone who was involved. Um, and it was a whole process to get that cover together. And yeah, I think it's, it sort of incorporates um, from a design standpoint and from a VFX standpoint, so much of what I was passionate about. Uh, this is another cover that I did for Emmeline recently. Uh, it incorporates this frame that I designed and it's been 3D modeled. It was used for her most recent track. Um, a lot of my work, this and the Queen cover is oftentimes re referencing historical women or referencing uh, women's place in the past and sort of recontextualizing it in a position of power and a position of authority. Um, so the poses are very deliberate. There's a lot of thought that goes into how can we pose her? What will, what essence or ambiance will that give as a result of the way she's styled? And how can we take courtiers or people that were previously um, celebrated from male point of view and sort of recontextualize it? This is almost like a, a reference to Joan of Arc um, but the, uh, the actual frame was all 3D modeled in individual parts. So it was all kind of a very elaborate process. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how I work. And part of my process as well is there's the actual design part, but then there's working with the clients. And what I found really fascinating is that a lot of the times client might say to me, oh, well, I have to present myself as smaller, or more humble, because a lot of the times women are told to do that. And part of what I do is tell them to own their power in their space and, you know, to embrace their identities in multiple ways. Um, and so that is also part of this process of making is my interaction with that client or artist or subject and trying to 
create that empowerment for them through our discussions. And yeah, so this is a quote that was said to me actually by a big company uh, this past year. And it really shocked me um, for a couple of reasons because it seems a little passe for probably most people, but I think that it was also inspiring to me because the idea of female empowerment not being a brand value, uh, a big brand, meant that what would the world, to me, created the question of what would the world look like if it was a big value at a big brand? Or how could someone fill this gap that no one is filling in creating a true female empowerment aesthetic? So to me, it seemed kind of obvious that this topic requires design, art, engineering, all of these things to really be addressed and um, that people often say they're for female empowerment, but the tangible application is a lot more complicated, requires research and thought and creativity, all of those things, which I'm quite passionate about. Um, so yeah, that was kind of a takeaway. And so why, why do this? Why empower women? Where have we gone a long way since um, cave times, but we're still, you know, have a decent amount of progress to before we are actually truly equal. And just from my experiences in the tech industry, this is a commonality, which, um, you know, uh, sec sexual harassment and racial discrimination are widespread issues. And, the, and that reality has inspired my work to focus on feminine power through the use of diverse images. I believe that the media we consume directly reflects and shapes our worldview. So it's particularly important to make work consciously and purposefully that embraces and uplifts a diverse population so that we can see ourselves represented and so that the marginalization of women and minorities is no longer tolerated. So yeah, I guess that's a big inspiration for me is the fact that this is a big problem and that um, as designers, we can address it and by just using this as fuel to create artwork, imagery, but also design and products that will help women that are in these situations. But ultimately there's systemic change that needs to happen. And I think that part of that is just going forward and making things in spite of uh, maybe some of the systems designed to keep you from expressing yourselves. And you would be very shocked at the amount of systems that keep some of the work that I was making out of the public. But we see zeitgeist in music where women are empowered and I have very much um, attach myself to those individuals in our work and just in our values. And that can also be transferred into the technology sphere as well. And I think that's what really excites me from a long-term perspective is what kind of products or what kind of ways of thinking will be invented as a result of both the suffering and the inspiration that comes with this problem that has not been solved. There isn't really real resources that are addressing it truly in a complete way. So that's um, an important thing to know, I think, even entering the industry is that being a woman are, can very much lead to situations that you would never expect or dictate your career or where it goes next. And even in the context outside of, um, you know, the, the career industry or career field, women are still facing issues of empowerment globally um, and obviously in Afghanistan. We've seen a terrible uh, experience this year where women have had their rights taken away from them and their right to education, to have ownership over their own lives. I can't imagine for the women that have grown up like me or uh, other women with complete freedom, just having that taken away in an instant. And um, I think this is truly a global problem because we're not just, female power is not always just about looking glamorous on an album cover, it's about um, being able to own who you are and have access to the life that you want to lead. And that's still such a major problem globally. And I think they're all interconnected in this sphere of design that I'm trying to create. Um, and so from there, <laughs> on my VFX work, I was recently published in Time Magazine alongside Victoria Modista, who is a bi bionic pop artist who has her avatar in this image. Uh, she's also part of the disability community. Uh, she's really incredible. There's like prosthetics that are in here that have been influenced by her vision. Um, and a lot of what we were trying to do is create an imaginative um, vision of what future environments will look like 
where women are sort of having conversations with their past and with the future and generating new ideas um, in terms of how the future will be molded. So this environment, although it's simulated, is very much a re representation of the past, the bone, the essence of humanity, of women's history, and also the future, these um, ethereal virtual beings and how you might have dialogue with them and sort of biomorphism and a relationship with how um, biology and sort of the Neri Oxman way of thinking will integrate into uh, the design and uh, technology fields. And so this is actually on exhibit this week in New York, uh, which is great, which is part of the reason I'm here. This is a detailed shot of everything is like hand sculpted and rendered and there's some procedural modeling. My techniques are very varied. If I were to give anyone sort of advice on VFX, I would say don't rely on the tool, rely on what you're passionate about as the inspiration and find the tools that will help you create that. Because oftentimes I see work that either looks like it's just a reflection of Adobe or Redshift or whatever, but almost everything I make is just such <laughs> a mixed match of so many different processes and technology that it becomes really what it's meant to be, which is the piece itself, not the technology. And so I think that that's super important. And that's something that I advise people in creating work. And obviously um, this is used for uh, a, um, and, uh, an idea that I'm really excited about, which is Time wanted to create art pieces with leading global artists and VFX artists around building a better future. And Almost all of these pieces focus on, on big issues that are happening right now around, around racism, discrimination, environmentalism, um, uh, you know, uh, it's all the topics that I talk about today, women's empowerment and um, disability, like there, it really touches the things that we should be caring about. And I think that um, to that extent, being involved in an initiative like this is really important. And this piece sold pretty well on the market, which I think for a student, that's, you know, that's something good to know that entering the NFT space could be a big part of how you shape your future career because it's a way to directly make design or art practices that are involved with the public, but it's not necessarily through a client. So you are, you as yourself as the artist are sort of your own client and you have to come up with a vision that will translate into what you want to put out in the world. But I think this community is starting off on the right foot, which is Let's not just you know make art for the sake of it. Let's make art that's going to project into history that will teach people to think about new ideas in a new way. And I think that that's one of the most exciting things about 3D is that you can visualize things that you've never really seen before, or you can show people new worlds. And that's my uh, favorite part about it. There is a project that I'm going to show you um, now, which is a sneak peek basically of a product design that I've been working on for the past six months. Um, and it incorporates a lot of what I'm saying in the context of product design. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to showing you this clip. So without further ado, um, here it is. So that, I'm gonna show it one more time just so everyone can see it again. So that is a car design that I've been working on with an incredible car, French car designer, Edward Cizo, for the past six months. We both saw an incredible value in introducing new shapes, new forms to an industry that has largely ignored women in a lot of ways, um, and as far as particularly in the car design element. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of research right now based on the fact that women have been sort of invisible and in data collected around cars. There's a novel, if you're interested, called Invisible Women, which is all about data that's been ignored within the tech industry and beyond. A lot of it talks about how um, women are the main 
uh, have the main power in spending and families are influenced purchasing with cards, but a lot of the times they are not directly advertised to. And it even goes as far to say that women are not even included in the data for test dummies. Often they use male or test dummies that are male sized, so women are more likely to die in certain vehicles. There's basically been a lot of bias that's been involved in car design, and I see that as an opportunity because I think that future cars should be designed for, for women and incorporating women's needs and interests and in art history as well. So this car is very much influenced by Zaha Hadid, by Iris Van Erpen. There's a lot of modern references within that. Um, I've perceived some interest in this project. Love to show it to Elon Musk one day. Um, but yeah, I think that the um, general idea is looking at forms from a more of a curvilinear or ionic perspective versus this impenetrable hard edge sort of masculine perspective. So I'm sort of defining it within these two realms. So you can see very clearly what I'm suggesting as it relates to products. And this is just one concept piece essentially that can evolve and I'm sure will evolve over the course of what we've made. Um, but I think that it speaks to the fact that there's so much to do in so many different industries around this topic or that there's so many resources or sources of inspiration um, that have been incredible and ultimately never been incorporated because I think sometimes we see femininity as weakness or as not universal and we see masculinity as universal or something that everyone will want. But I think that as the world evolves and we feel more comfortable expressing all sides of ourselves as human beings, it will be more accepted or more understood that femininity doesn't just relate to women, although that's a big part of my practice. Everyone has femininity in them and they can express it however they please and there shouldn't be anything wrong with that. And so that's sort of my, my perspective. Um, and yeah, so this car design, all of the forms were sort of considered really heavily in terms of how are we gonna integrate the female body in all these new ways? How could we still keep the aerodynamics? And so it really was a true innovative mission. And um, when Edward showed it to some people around car studios like BMW and stuff in France, they were all passing it around the studio like, oh my gosh, look at this, this is so new because the shapes are, would, would be maybe considered too um, risky for some people to incorporate, but there's no reason we couldn't create forms that are more representative of, of an extension of a woman as cars are almost like true extensions of our bodies in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, that was sort of my perspective in making this. I obviously have a lot of broad interests. We started with a sketch in a dorm room I did for an album cover of a logo, and now we're looking at a car design. But I think that that is really how every creative's process should work, is that you shouldn't be confined or limited by anyone's beliefs around what your box is. I think that this next generation should be more freeform and experiment with a lot of different tools and think about how their overall philosophy and interest can pertain to not just what their desired industry is, but also expand beyond to different industries um, and different purposes. So yeah, that, that's sort of um, my perspective. This is a little bit of behind the scenes of how I made my poster. So that avatar is not real. That's an uh, avatar, not a photo of me, um, but it was made using um, this virtual software by Nina, Nina Hawkins and it was used with face scans of me and photos and we worked on this together and then this is a sketch of the jacket that I worked on with dress X and also an early rough model of the glasses and how they got turned into their their final form so they also involved um, some sort of nifty work in rhino and then they were also sculpted in zbrush so this project or this poster was secretly giving you a hint of everything that I do um, from almost all perspectives, which is combination of product design, of um, 3D modeling, sculpture, VFX work, and then also sort of personifying female power in new and exciting ways. Um, so if I were to give you a, a sort of final thought of what I've learned or what advice I would give um, based on my career thus far, I would say, trust your instincts. You might have a million people in the room saying this is wrong or this is too crazy, but that will lead to more people being interested in what you have to say eventually. And then you can make big changes in the industry, promote new ideas and new styles, which leads to my second piece of advice, which is develop your own unique voice. You don't have to be like everyone else. 
everyone might be going one way or all being inspired by the same designers. You can be inspired by a painter or architecture or the clouds or nature or anything that really inspires you for, for its form and you can integrate that into your philosophy. The third one, which is take risks, which is not always easy because in a lot of contexts, it's easier to go the safe route, but sometimes taking risks is what leads to big impact. There was an opportunity for me to make a, perhaps a much safer cover for Nikki and Cardi and I went and I did something that was crazier and they loved it and it went out and perhaps they wouldn't have picked my, my cover if I hadn't chosen to take a risk in that instance. Um, my other piece of advice is embrace both failures and successes. I've had just as many failures as I've had successes and together they are building blocks of your future and will always make you stronger. Nothing is a clear line to success. Um, there's always gonna be ups and downs, all, which also reminds me to tell you to ignore negative detractors. If you want to do something new and interesting, it's okay if not. Um, everyone supports you and they probably won't. And that tends to be the way it goes. The other point is champion yourself, which is especially for women can be kind of hard. So you might be told, oh, you have to know your place or you know, don't get a big head. Uh, I've been told those things, but um, I think the only way to really leave an impact in the world on what you care about is if you're willing to stand up for both your work and yourself in order to push that vision forward. And so I think championing yourself is, is just an essential part of whatever design practice you choose to engage in. And when you see issues in the world, this is my last piece of advice, don't ignore them and just go with the crowd. Use your skills and talents to challenge the status quo. The issues that I brought up today are by no means solved, but I am trying my best to leave a little bit of a dent in them. And that's part of what I'm hoping to do in my time on, on this planet. And um, I truly believe that everyone in this room is gifted and talented and can leave an, a substantial impact on the world and in the issues that they care about. And there should be no limits to the avenues or skill sets that you use to uh, incorporate that into that vision. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's my talk, Feminine Future. Thanks for <laughs> listening. And um, I'm leaving some time for the Q&A portion of things. So if you have any questions, I can also go back and um, go through different things if you have any additional questions on my pieces, but. Yes, yeah, so like Katie said, we have like 20 minutes or so for time. If, you, if anyone has any questions in the audience at all, I know I have questions, but I want other people to go first. So feel free to leave them in the chat and I'll save them or just unmute and go for it. Okay, let's all get started for questions. Yeah. I was wondering about like, when you're at Apple, what type of pushback did you see yourself getting pushed back when you when you were an intern, like when you were trying to like subliminally put stuff into the poster designs you were working on? Did you ever get pushback, or did people notice? Or like, I just think it's a really important thing, even like subliminal messaging in a way throughout culture that can really impact people's mindsets around change, especially around changing the conversations around this topic. So, interesting, you got any pushback there? Um, I think for that particular um, logo that I showed from Apple. It was for an event in Brooklyn where they were trying to incorporate lots of different artists' point of view. So it kind of slipped in. I don't think it necessarily was noticed or the, the meaning was noticed, but I think that the, the purpose of that project was to incorporate different artists' visions. So um, that existed there well. Um, in terms of sort of the other artists' references that I spoke of today, like you know, Judy Chicago, Georgia O'Keeffe, where we see those represented in the CG space, I wouldn't say that any tech company has really embraced incorporating female art into the way that they think about CGI, even though they create universal design languages or products that go out to everyone. And that's something that I still think needs to change because I think that if we're only pulling from one source of inspiration, usually all white male European artists for the most part, and we're handing that to people and devices or all these different forms, then we're not really representing a universal approach to design, we're representing a very specific bias. And so I think that in order to sort of change that, we'd have to incorporate more 
designers and artists that come from different backgrounds and use them as the universal platform or truly believe that what they're doing is just as universal as what these um, European men are doing. And yeah, so I think that there's room to change, room for change within that space. That's great. Thanks for the response. I know we have in chat, Adela was asking, this is a little bit off topic, but kind of related. Do you have any thoughts on the metaverse that Zuckerberg is building? <laughs> yes, I do. I mean, I think that um, Facebook, like a lot of other tech companies are receiving backlash right now for their lack of ethics and their policies. And I think that the metaverse is probably as much of a PR stunt in relationship to those issues as anything else. Um, but I think that in terms of the metaverse, I think that there needs to be, obviously my position is sort of consistent with my work, which is I think there needs to be more women in this space that are able to kind of visualize what, what environments we're going into or how we want to represent ourselves, or what's the purpose of our existence within this space. Um, and I think a lot of that is really com complex human and behavior thinking that, um, you know, we need just more people. And the problem, I think, my biggest problem with metaverse or any kind of representations of that right now is that I'm aware of the fact that a lot of the creators have a very similar, <laughs> which, um, you know, a room of people that kind of might believe the same things. And we need more people like Tim and Guru, who's at uh, Google, who famously was trying to push back against the AI biases against um, people of color. Like there's things like that that make me doubt the actual universality of a metaverse. So I think that if Zuckerberg were listening to this call, I would tell him you better get more women and people of color in the room if you really want to make the metaverse. Otherwise, you're going to be making the Zuckerverse, which will apply to very few people. <laughs> so that would be my, my advice to him if he was on this call. Thank you. That's a good point you bring up. <laughs> Looks like Adela has another question about any tips on how to frame your perspective or voice when you're the only female in a room? How do you find yourself stand your ground? It's an amazing question. Um, sometimes you're not gonna be the most popular person in the room if you, there's, there's times where you have to choose, I would say, um, about what matters most to you, the work or being liked. And sometimes you have to make the decision that you wanna get work out that you're really passionate about, you have to, you know, do everything possible to encourage your audience or your group to push it through. And some people might not like that. I've had experiences where I've had projects go through that I had to do a little extra push for. And sometimes some of those people in the project aren't super happy, but then it goes out and that leads to change and it leads to more projects. So I think that it's sort of um, a balancing act of just picking your moments and that I would never tell you, oh, you can go into a room and say, I, I think this is the way things should be. And especially with a lot of really powerful people or men in specific and have that well received is not, it, it, sometimes it is. Sometimes people love when there's people with new ideas that can give new insights, but sometimes being a young woman, especially they will see that as not knowing your place. So <laughs> I think to, to challenge the status quo, you need a little bit of um, gusto, uh, chutzpah and, um, a little bit of passion and relationship to what you're doing and know that it's worth it for whatever obstacles you might face and just keep your eye on what your goal is. So if you're in a room where you really wanna push forward a new innovative like female centric idea and you're in, all the men are saying, no, this won't relate to anyone, i be them. Um, you have to just sort of do everything you can, I guess, to, to make a powerful argument for why you're doing what you're doing. So, I mean no different than, I think sometimes the work also can speak for itself. So my other piece of advice would be use your, all of your design tools. If you're gonna go at something that might not be well received by everyone, make it the best thing they've ever seen. And then that will make it harder to push down or deny. So I think that using your talents and your design philosophy to, um, to maybe push against a little bit of a grain is, is the best way that I found success, yeah. Thank you for that. It's a great response. It seems like a, like the confidence kind of snowballs. Like you get one, you, you do something and like you get the good response. And you're like, okay, I feel better myself. Now I can, I can do bigger things. I can do bigger things. It just keeps going, keeps going, which is like a really good cycle. But I think it's tough for some people to get started with that first leap of confidence. But we also have a question from Keenan uh, about client working with clients. So 
When clients request to see some of your work, do you prefer sending a PDF or sending the client to review your website? Um, a lot of the times I prefer sending either a locked PDF or a keynote because some of my projects are sort of secret projects that I haven't published. So, or some of them are NDA projects, like all my Apple work, it's not in here because it's under NDA for the most part. And a lot of my Google stuff isn't in here either. So I think a lot of that is, will help a client better understand your, your um, sphere of uh, depending on what you've done, but your sphere of background, if you have protected work, sending a PDF prefer or having a locked website. I think I'm currently working on my website. It's been in renovation for the past couple of months. So once that's finished, I'll probably send most clients there. But I think also you can cater to the client. So a lot of the times, like because I have a diverse skill set, I've sent my portfolio kind of cold to some people and they're like, this is so much. I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> and so for instance, like a typography client, I would just send my type stuff or my 3D work, I would just send my VFX work to someone who's interested in that. And that can kind of narrow down sometimes um, for the client, what you do and how well you do it if you do multiple things and allow you to gain um, their confidence. So I would say that sometimes you can tailor what you send to the person that's seeing it and that will help with the client relationships. Yeah. Awesome. We have two questions in chat they're pretty similar both related to 3d modeling and i think i might add a little thing to it but do you have any advice on getting started with 3d modeling or rendering and then do you have recommendations on 3d tools and then i think i would add if there's financial limitations to 3d which a lot of like i know zbrush marvelous designer a lot of these have paywalls what is your recommendation for a student who's interested in 3d I think Blender can be a really great introduction and it's a free software. I think that um, if you can take classes at school, I was in graphic design at RISD, but I took 3D modeling across every different department and I got a lot of free softwares that way. I actually trained in industrial design. I did advanced CAD modeling at RISD and then I also did ZBrush sculpting in the illustration department. Pretty much anything that was 3D that had a course, I was on that. So I would say, I would suggest that if you have courses that tailor to teaching you these tools that you take them and really think of them as the future and um, incorporate as much of the time that you have with that free software into your um, ac academics. But I would also say that um, with 3D modeling, that it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If you're doing product modeling, then Rhino is definitely the best place to start because it's very spline based, very specific. I mean, if you're industrial design, you know that that's, that or solid works is where to go. Um, but if you're trying to really innovate and sort of do stuff like what I'm doing, I, I think actually ZBrush is the best place to start because it's a very sculptural software. It's so powerful. I mean, every CG monster in every movie is usually made with ZBrush, like every Stranger Things creature is made with that software. So it's pretty, um, pretty amazing what it can do. And um, it's quite intuitive. So if you love fine art, if you enjoy like sculpting or design, or seeing um, very, a very intuitive interface, uh, ZBrush, I think is, is really great. But I think Cinema 4D for rendering is where I would go for the most part. But for someone who's really, really just trying to learn the very basics, I would say playing around with 3D models in Keyshot, um, which you can get trials of, is a really amazing tool because it does um, render, rendering in real time. And so that allows you to see how different materials react, how you can change environments to sort of create new ideas um, and just kind of open your eyes to 3D in a way that's less daunting. A lot of rendering work within Cinema 4D and Redshift is very time consuming and energy <laughs> expensive, but Keyshot is a very, quick and fast way to see a manifestation of an idea in 3D. So I would highly recommend that. And if you're into VR and um, you have a VR headset, also diving into medium and sculpting can be really useful in terms of getting um, a perspective on um, how to make models maybe outside of ZBrush or something like that. But I would say just a lot of these things do have free trials or they have educational programs where if you can say that you're in school and you can send them your ID, they'll give you a, a really good price or free software. So um, if you're looking for a completely free, I would say Blender is your best bet, but a lot of these other softwares have um, different capabilities based on being a student that would allow you to overcome some of those um, expense issues. 
but yeah, I mean, um, I would also say just my advice for 3D making is, yeah, learn as much as you can. I really think this is the future and just, I mean, being at the right place at the right time is so important for artists and designers. And part of the reason I did this Time Magazine um, opportunity and it led to all these other things in 3D was because I was doing the effects work and I was doing female centric VFX work, which no one else was really doing. So it kind of led me to be one of the leaders that they wanted involved in this um, campaign and this process. So there's a power into incorporating your identity into your VFX work. And there's a power in um, allowing your instincts or your inspirations to guide you versus just the software. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my VFX <laughs> tips, um, I guess. That's great. I put a couple of the names in chat too. We also have like a, well, a couple of other good questions in chat. So from Courtney, when does the music enter concept development? I'd imagine final albums slash songs aren't actually complete until much later. Um, that's true and not true, depending on the artist. Um, a lot of the times they have the song done or nearly done when they start the album cover process. With the wild side song they had that was planned months in advance so they had the song and i was listening to it on my phone before everyone else and i was trying to channel that energy into the cover so um that's one of the cool parts of doing stuff in music sometimes you'll get the sneak peek of a big track before it comes out and you'll get to really um think about how that might relate to a visual um which is super cool but sometimes when there's been instances where they don't have like the queen cover with nikki i think i had a couple clips or something like that but it was very under lock and key a lot of that had to relate to just the actual art form and what she was wanting to express and um you know her stage of who she is in that point of her life so a lot of the times with artists it's seen as you know chapters and then cultural chapters even um and that they want to document that in a way that is very authentic so i think part of that process is very personal so it almost extends beyond music and to their identity and so it's not limited to the music although the music is oftentimes embodying that identity so i would say that working with their identity and sort of their persona in a very specific way as as it relates to them in that time period is sort of how you can generate ideas or artistic concepts that without music necessarily present at that time. Um, yeah, hopefully that answered the question. Um, I think that definitely answered it. We have a we have a, a question from Ray as well about how do you find collaborators and how do you initiate those relationships? I'll I'm back on my phone. Um, so yeah, to answer the question about how I find my collaborators, is that the, the last question? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I have, it very much depends on the project. I think that I like to work with a lot of women, especially because I like to teach. I really like to incorporate um, what I've learned into um, uh, how other women might see the world and challenge them to think bigger. A lot of the times when I'm working with a collaborator I themselves, I will say, no, this needs to look more powerful, bigger, bigger, let's go <laughs> even more intense. And I think that, I enjoyed that um, women and incorporating my philosophy. I'm so sorry. I just had to grab a charger to make sure I was available. Okay. So, um, yes. So that's sort of how I go about it is trying to find women specifically a lot of times, but that's not really always the case. Like with Edward, um, when we worked on the car design, it had more to do with his passion for culture and wanting to push things forward. And I'm very attracted to innovators and people that, are not afraid to take risks. So I would say that the people that I look for are people that are doing something a little bit different. Like when I saw some of his work, I had never seen anything like that before. And I knew that whatever we would collaborate on, it would be totally unique. So I think that the kind of collaborators I look for are people that are doing things that are new and exciting and different. And also people that wanna learn from what I'm, I'm doing and be involved in the process. If you're passionate about some of the things I'm passionate about, we tend to make really great work together. Um, Jora Francis, who is the incredible photographer and director who shot the Normani cover and who worked with me on another project that's coming out soon, is super passionate about empowering women and um, women in the Middle East. And that 
really inspires me. And we have a lot of really impactful conversations about what kind of work we're making, what's going to be the impact and, you know, what visual references should we have? How should the CGI be reflection of that? So I think that having similar values or similar goals can be really important to me and sort of the work that I'm making and that we're all on the same page. Um, but I would say, you know, if you want to work with me, if that's part of why you asked the question, always feel free to DM me and, um, uh, send me information. My my full time assistant right now just followed me on Instagram, DM'd me, and liked a bunch of my stuff and asked me about my work and ended up hiring her to just be an assistant and sort of go with me on different projects. And my studio is very expansive in the sense that I've done VFX work and now I'm working product design and a bunch of other big projects coming out in relationship to space, which is really cool. I thought I was going to be able to show you a sneak peek of one of those, but uh, no, because <laughs> of the some of the NDAs involved. But um, there's a lot of really cool stuff that I work on. And I think that um, I like to work with people that are expansive and thinking big and want to change the world. So that sounds like you feel free to shoot me a, a DM and I will answer promptly. <laughs> yeah. I think this will be the last question. It's, really, it's, it's from Ray as well. It's based around collaboration, but if collaborators have a strong vision on the project as well, how do you navigate working with them? I think that, um, I mean, it depends on what kind of, what's the collaboration nature. If I've hired someone to help me work on a project that I'm doing my, like where I have a very distinct vision for it, like we, or I've already agreed upon that with a client, then usually a lot of the times my work is client-based and it tends to be the final decision ends up with the client, but there's been situations where, you know, I've worked with a lot of big creative energies where sometimes something that I will want will go through and sometimes something that they will want will go through. And it's sort of like a little bit of a push and pull in terms of, um, you know, really collaborating and getting a vision out. I think that um, to what the earlier person's question of, have you ever been in a room where you're the only woman trying to push an idea forward I've had instances like that where sort of to speak to collaboration with big energies don't always make a lot of fans, but you make the fans after the work comes out. So I think that that uh, it depends on what you're willing to do. If you really feel like, oh, my gosh, I will die if this piece of art does not come out, then I think it's worth pushing for it. A lot of the times I feed off that energy, too. So if someone presents an idea that's you know much stronger than mine. I'm like, let's go with this. I want, I want the work to be the best it will possibly be. So I think that that's really important too, which is like, you, you can be passionate and also humble enough to recognize that the work is ultimately what should matter, not whose idea is chosen. And so um, if you've made the best thing, then definitely fight for it. If you haven't, it's okay to just, you know, support another idea and get it out in the best possible way. And um, yeah, I've, I've had multiple experiences in both of those regards. And I think that um, sort of is on a project by project basis of what's what issues are being faced or what clients are involved. But I would say my overall advice with working with strong collaborators is be open minded, but also trust your gut. So if you really feel passionate about something, present that in the best way possible. But if there's other ideas that come forward, don't be afraid to think outside of your own box and examine how maybe you can incorporate their ideas or make something even bigger. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Katie. That's a good one to end on. Just getting ready to eco for the mission. Um, if anyone has any final questions, um, I don't think we have time today, but feel free to reach out to Katie. It sounds like she's very willing to talk outside of here. Um, if, so, if students do want to reach out to you, where can they find you or reach or follow you at? Um, I have, um, my Instagram is pretty, uh, common place that people reach out to me. It's McIntyre design. It's my last name. And then design, if you want to follow me on there or send me a message, um, it also has a contact button that it goes directly to my email. So if you want to contact me on email through my Instagram, that's a good way to get in contact with me. Um, yeah. And I definitely, I mean, if you have any other questions or, looking for guidance or mentorship or anything, I'm happy to review portfolios or give tips or do anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, this is such an amazing school and audience of innovators and creative thinkers. And I hope that some of what I said today maybe made you question a little bit of 
the guidelines of the world and maybe what we aren't allowed to do and why and how we can use our creativity to overcome some of those challenges and help people globally who are still don't have the creativity or design tools or STEM knowledge to innovate around this topic. Um, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much for your time today, Katie. It's great to have you. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I hope people take advantage of the opportunity to reach out to you and get some more advice. <laughs>